Hey, this is Julio. Hey, this is Steve. Before the podcast starts, we want to welcome and give you the opportunity to support our ministry by visiting our website at www.bridgemenlaredo.org. Scroll down to the bottom of any page and you'll find the PayPal donate button. Bridge Ministries exists to share the glorious good news of Jesus Christ and to equip people to be transformed by the renewing of their minds. If you would like to help us in our mission of making affordable or free Bibles and Christian books available and also to check out the orphanage that we support, visit our website. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, coming at you again from the great state of Texas, another episode of Bridge Radio, where we're proclaiming the gospel faithfully and fearlessly. I am your host, as always, Julio Rodriguez. I got a, I got a little bit of a, of a stuffy nose and stuff. Apologize about that. I might be making some edits. I just got out of a fever, and I'm riding away from it. Um, across from me, I got the man from the valley himself, A.W. Varilla. A.K.A. Abe from the Valley. <laughs> and across from me, we got the boss, the founder himself of Bridge Ministries. Hey, what's up? Steve Denartog here. All right, guys. Well, for some of our listeners who, uh, who, who are uh, familiar with the program and have been tuning in recently, we're on the series of the Doctrines of Grace. Last week, we had John Frame, and that was pretty awesome just to get to uh, talk with him before, during, and after the show. Good brother in Christ. Yeah, very good, good mind, good, yeah, good, good stuff, man. Um, and so, anyway, I got two announcements before we jump in and introduce our guest for today. Um, one, drop us a review on iTunes for a chance to win a free bridge travel mug to keep your beverage nice and warm. Uh, if, if you if you would rather not have the bridge travel mug, we've got some free books from PNR uh, for those of you who don't know we are a reformed christian bookstore and coffee shop so uh yeah we'll be sending you out some good stuff secondly we're holding an, an apologetics conference at texas a&m international university may 26 we got four speakers uh one of our keynote speakers being the last one is mr slick matt slick from carm.org if you don't know him get to know him he's a good brother and friend of the ministry um, if you want f- more information on that you can visit our website at www.bridgebookstexas.org or send me an email at julio bridgeman at gmail.com all right guys so we ready to dive in let's do it let's do it all right well today we continue our series on the doctrines of grace the last podcast we had again the honor and privilege of having dr john frame kick off our series on the topic of the sovereignty of god Uh, we discussed divine lordship how the sovereignty of god plays into our understanding of the doctrines of grace the tension between divine sovereignty and man's free will and more please go check out that one Uh, we felt it necessary to have this discussion and teaching before diving into the doctrines of grace, because the reform view of the sovereignty of God undergirds um, the entire teaching of TULIP and the doctrines of grace, uh, and we at Bridge here affirm that God is absolutely sovereign over all things, even over salvation. And uh, and this is what the doctrines of grace focus on. It's a comprehensive description and explanation of the sovereignty of God and salvation taught in the acronym TULIP, the T standing for total depravity, the U standing for un- unconditional election, the L standing for limited atonement, the I standing for irresistible grace, and the P standing for perseverance of the saints. In today's episode, we're going to be spending time unpacking and learning about total depravity with a a very special guest. And uh, let me go and and, and introduce him. It's, uh, again, just like John Frame, it's a true honor and privilege to introduce the guest that we have on today, Um, because a lot of what we have implemented here at Bridge, uh, one being this podcast that we're, we're having here is a result of not only him, but also his church and ministry. He's a pastor and elder of Apologia Church in Tempe and has worked many years at, uh, as a hospital chaplain. He's not only a popular speaker, but also a public debater. Uh, our guest appeared on a series for the History Channel called The Stone Age. Uh, he's a world champion martial artist with five black belts. Uh, he's played Michelangelo and Donatello, Donatello on the Mut- Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles franchise, as well as Johnny Cage on Mortal Kombat The Tour. Uh, he not only fights for sport, but more importantly, fights to end abortion to save the lives of the unborn chil- 
children through the message of the gospel. He's the host of Apologia Radio, a well-known pro- podcast that proclaims the gospel and engages the culture of today. Welcome, Jeff Durbin, and thank you for coming on Bridge Radio. What's up, guys? Thanks so much for having me. It really is a pleasure, and, and uh, man, it's a blessing to hear that, that God's been using the ministry to to uh, get you guys on your feet. That's awesome. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The the, the re- I would say the reason of this of this podcast that we're doing here and a, a lot of stuff uh, that we've imp- implemented or want to implement in the future with Bridge Ministries is is definitely uh, seeing you guys and what you guys are doing out there in Tempe. You guys have been a, a huge blessing, and so definitely want to let you know that. God be the glory, y'all. Yes. Um. Uh, so Jeff, uh, I, I wanted to ask. Uh, we've had Douglas Wilson on the program. He was uh, he for he 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 held on to uh I guess or. Arminian theology, and as well as uh, John Sampson. Um, I wanted to ask, did you ever at one point hold to any form of Arminian theology before coming to uh, the Reform camp? <clears throat> yes, certainly. Um, I wasn't raised in a Christian home under the uh-huh. hearing of the gospel. Um, I heard the gospel for the first time when I was about 16 years old, and I had not grown up in church reading reading the Bible, and this was all new to me. The, I mean, the basic understanding that I had was that there was this person named Jesus, people say he died and rose again, and that book that collects about an inch of dust um, <laughs> on our shelf uh, was the Bible. That was his book, and that was my understanding. And so when I heard that um, Christ's work was to save sinners and that through faith in him we could be saved and it wasn't through our own righteousness, right? Um, that was my entrance into the Christian faith. And so I started going to a a church for the first time, and I I was in high school, and after I had uh, made this profession of faith in Christ, I ran into my first, like, real, real, real professing Christian, and it turned Mm. out his father was a pastor at a a small Baptist church, like, out in the woods uh, near Washington, D.C., and I started going to this church and started reading the Bible, and everything that I adopted initially— I had just taken for granted that these are believers, this is our book, and this is what this book says. So everything that was said to me, taught to me, I I just kind of took uncritically. So a lot of the philosophy behind Arminianism, the the anthropology, the view of man, the fall Mm -hmm. itself, and predestination, how God saves, God looks through time to see who will believe in him, and on Mm -hmm. that basis makes a determination to choose them. And all of that, I had just sort of absorbed I ended up going to um, International Baptist Bible College here in Tempe, Arizona, when I moved to Arizona when I was mm-hmm. 18. And that was the same same thing. It was essentially, I mean, eschatology was the popular eschatology of evangelicalism today. It was dispensational premillennialism, and I, I, I adopted that, of course, and mm-hmm. I also adopted all of the ways that we think about and we talk about okay. um uh, 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 man's condition. So, and I say that in terms of eschatology, just to say, like, you know, basically everything that was said to me, I, I just, I took in. And, mm-hmm. uh, and so that was my position. My basic position was an Arminian position. However, there was one thing that caused the, the big hiccup, and mm-hmm. that was this. I first heard the gospel, I heard it through the Billy Graham organization on television, mm-hmm. and that night when I prayed that prayer, uh, I still question whether that initial um, conversion was genuine, but... Right. Um, but I, I called the number, I received their materials, and that what they sent me was the gospel according to John. Hmm. And so this, this is what did it for me. Hmm. My, my entrance into all of this, reading the Word of God and absorbing this, was, was started with the gospel of John hmm. over and over and over and over again. So hmm. I experienced a lot of conflict early on because I had the right. gospel of John, the foundation, all those truths about our condition, God's sovereignty, what Christ does for his sheep— and I had all these other kind of Arminian beliefs hanging around, and that created the ultimate conflict later, which led me into Reformed theology. Hmm. Awesome, awesome. Well, that's a little, cool. yeah, that's awesome. Um, a little quick note on eschatology too. Uh, I'd say Steve and I s- uh, change eschatology <laughs> uh, as a result of some of y'all's podcasts as well. The post I was kind of an agnostic. I'm ill, and then I <laughs> kind of drifted to the post mill camp. So yeah, yeah. Oh, right on, right on. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, all right, so let's let's dive into uh, total depravity. So I mentioned at the beginning, Jeff, uh, tulip as a mean of as a means of teaching the doctrines of grace. Uh, can you touch on the history of how we got the acronym tulip? Yes. So um, 
essentially the the synod of dort the center of the controversy around the, this aspect of reformed theology and it's so important to say that especially today with so many people that have sort of entered into the reformed camp by way of the doctrines of grace uh the the aspect of reformed theology which is much larger uh, than just the doctrines of grace, uh, the tulip, the acrostic tulip, came about at something called the Synod of Dort, and what that represented was uh, the followers of a man named Jacob Arminius, uh, who at that time was essentially done gone, and the followers and people who had been influenced by a man named John Calvin, um, essentially had a collision. The followers of Jacob Arminius uh, formed a an official remonstrance, and that means protest. Mm-hmm. And what they did was they were protesting the church at large at the time that was uh, actually, you know, pretty diverse at the time. It wasn't just one particular denomination. I mean, the Reformed world was pretty diverse by that time. And they were they were protesting the church at large, and it was based upon uh, essentially five points of contact. And so when people talk about, like, the five points of Calvinism today, people will say things like, well, I follow Jesus, I follow the Bible, I don't mm-hmm. follow a man. Mm-hmm. Well, first and foremost, the doctrines of grace have nothing to do with a man named John Calvin. Mm-hmm. It just, it very much like in history, we have titles over particular theological conflicts, whether it's Trinitarianism, uh, you know, you move your way through history, you have words to describe a theological conflict. Just by ease of discussion, the conflict is called Calvinism versus Arminianism, not because it really has anything to do with those Mm. two men, Mm. just has to do with the time period they were in and and all of that. So the followers of Jacob Arminius, um, that were influenced a lot by his thinking and, and by other thinking, they formed the Remonstrance Five Official Points of Protest. And what they were saying was, is that we disagree with the church at large here um, mm-hmm. over these five particular points. And one of the points is on man's condition. What they were suggesting was that man was not really spiritually dead, as the Reformers had been saying. And, of course, I would say, like the New Testament says, the Old Testament says, the early church had debated this point before. Mm-hmm. This was an issue with um, Augustine or Augustine, however you want to say it, however scholarly you are. Um, <laughs> that this, had, this had been debated before. And, by the way, this particular point of contact man's condition in the fall was a central point of the division between Rome and the Protestants, the Protestants. Okay, okay. So that's critical to get here. That, that's actually vital to get here. The Arminians were really on the side of Rome in this debate. Huh. And so the, it's not like the Reformers hadn't heard this, and oh my goodness, these guys, are, they're, they're, they're challenging here. We don't know what to say here. They, they had heard all this before. They knew where this was coming from. And the remonstrance was essentially an echo of the debate over the condition of man in the fall that had existed early on. Mm-hmm. It existed in the conflict between Rome and the Reformers. And so the Arminians were saying, we don't think man is really dead dead, like really dead spiritually. Right. He, is, he is sinful. He is corrupt. He is, you know, his nature is fallen. But he's not dead like you're saying. We think he still has the ability to cooperate synergistically with God's grace, to essentially cooperate with God in a way to make salvation possible. He's not so dead that he cannot cooperate. Mm-hmm. So they were suggesting a synergistic view of how ultimately a person is reconciled to God. There was the issue of free will, mm-hmm. and um, and so that's what they suggested. Of course, um, our particular point today is, is not on the other points, but uh, in terms of um, election, they were saying that we believe ultimately that uh, they weren't saying that God chooses people based upon his own sovereign will and grace. Mm-hmm. They were saying something to the effect of God looking through time, you know, to, to see who would believe in him, election based upon somebody else's moving towards God. Now, this this is the critical point, because anybody listening to this for the first time mm-hmm. that's not reformed, they might be irked over the title of the L in Tulip, and that's the limited atonement, which was the response of the reformers. The Arminians were essentially saying that we don't believe that Jesus died for anybody in particular on the cross. Uh He died to make people save bull, and so we we protest the idea that Jesus died for a particular people, that the atonement was actual for actual sins, from actual people. Uh It was to make men generally savable. Um, And so the other points, of course, in the protest were 
we think that people can resist God if he chooses, if he wants to save them, they can resist God by their own will. Ultimately, God's purposes there could be thwarted from their perspective. I don't know that they'd say it like that, but I think that's a logical conclusion of it. And the final point was perseverance of the saints. They were divided on this point here, but they essentially thought that, um, uh, you know, we're divided on this. Some people think that you can lose your salvation, some not. Mm -hmm. But they, they formed protest. Now, what the Synod of Dort represented was over a hundred scholars, theologians, pastors, missionaries that all came together over a period of years, I mean, literally years, mm -hmm. wow. to, to, to respond to the remonstrance, the protest, and they responded to the five points of major contact of the Arminians mm -hmm. with the five points of Calvinism. So ultimately, the five points of Calvinism are a response mm. to a protest, okay. and that's where you get the acrostic tulip. Total depravity, um, unconditional election, limited atonement, irresistible grace, and perseverance of the saints. There are better ways. I want to just say this final thing. Mm. There are better ways to express what they meant in that. I'll give you one example for the point we're talking about today. Total depravity did not mean for the reformers and those at Dort. It did not mean that man is depraved as he possibly could be. He's not as bad as he could be. Total mm -hmm. Depravity talked about his spiritual condition, that he was completely alienated, fallen, dead uh, in his sins, helpless, sinner, ungodly, unable to cooperate with the grace of God in himself to, to essentially save himself. And Jeff, uh, as you were just talking here on Total Depravity, the T in the acronym of TULIP, um, standing for Total Depravity, Depravity. Can you talk about what Reformed theology means by total depravity? I know that you just mentioned a little bit. And can you contrast it with the Armen Arminian equivalent, equivalent, sorry, with uh, with free will? The human ability. Yeah. In human ability, yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So what they were saying in response was very much what Augustine would have been saying in his debate, in his discussion, mm -hmm. uh, the whole discussion with Pelagius and Pelagianism versus, uh, and, and then even on into semi-Pelagianism. So this debate actually is very old. It was very old and it was before Dort, uh, much before Dort. And again, it did exist in the conflict between Rome and the reformers. But if you really want to get kind of the spark of this debate, you, d you have to dig further back uh, from Dort all the way to um, Augustine, Pelagius, Pelagianism, um, all that stuff. The, what is man's condition? Um, is he in himself? Is he born a tabula rasa? Is he born a blank slate? Right. Uh, and he sort of, you know, the old saying, it almost gets, it almost gets worn out by now, but does he pull himself up by his, by his bootstraps <laughs> yeah. through his own obedience, good deeds to, to sort of climb his way to God? Well, that was destroyed, annihilated in mm -hmm. the early church because obviously, no, we're born sinners. Romans 5, we're all dead. We're fallen in Adam. All we receive is condemnation and death. In sin did my mother conceive me. You can just, there's no end to the biblical text to demonstrate the Pelagianism is just pure stupidity. I mean, it's not biblical. Uh -huh. It's foolish. And so now watch, this is where it gets interesting. So Pelagianism is squashed. And in terms of man's will, his condition, uh -huh. and it's just annihilated. But what happened later, semi-Pelagianism, was sort of a blending of, well, maybe we're, you know, spiritually sick in a way, we're sinners, yeah, but we can still cooperate because of, we have a free will. Now, that's where a lot of this, it's already happened before. Uh -huh. um, so when you, when you move into the discussion of what's the difference, it comes down to what's your source, first and foremost, of how you're going to answer this question. Uh -huh. And that's vital. Part of Reformed theology, where it goes way beyond simply the doctrines of grace, is Reformed epistemology, and that is just a, a, a very expensive word that means, how do you know something? What's uh -huh. your theory of knowledge? Now, for, of course, the prophets in the scriptures, the apostles, and, of course, for Jesus, the fundamental place that's the ultimate foundation is the words of the living God. It's what Jesus appealed to in all conflicts. Uh -huh. He would say things like, have you not read what was spoken to you by God? And he, that's how he'd answer a question. Did you not read what God said to you? And right. he'd quote scripture. The Apostle Paul, when he wants to buttress his point, say in Romans chapter 4, to show that this has always been how God saves people, he quotes from scripture, Genesis 15, 6, Abraham believed God, it was credited to him as righteousness. It's have you not read? What does the scripture say? So the epistemology in scripture is John 17, 17. Thy hmm. word is truth. Hmm. So fundamental to this question is how are you going to go about answering it? Are you yeah. going to answer it based 
making your own traditions? Are you going to ba- are you going to do it based upon history and what some church father said, or are you going to answer it based upon Scripture? Now, here's the point: the reformers were saying, if your epistemology is biblical epistemology, if you're going to go to the Word of God to get the answer, then it doesn't matter what your philosophy is, what you've been told about our will. It doesn't matter what you think is true mm-hmm. here based on your own private experience or experience in a church or history. It matters what the scriptures say. So in the, in the issue of TULIP, the Arminian position today, I'd say best expressed today, is that people are sinners. Yes, they're mm-hmm. definitely sinners. They're fallen creatures. However, they're not so fallen that they can't cooperate with God synergistically, two forces at work, mm-hmm. um, and it, by an action of their own will, cooperate with God to make salvation possible. Now, what the scriptures say, and that, honestly, there is almost no end to, to this particular discussion. The scriptures say, John <laughs> chapter 6, 44, mm-hmm. it says, Jesus says to Jews there who were grumbling among themselves over what Jesus said. And remember, he just said to them in John 6, right. he just said to them, he says, um, I've come down from heaven to do my will, uh, not to do my will, but the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who has sent me, that of all that he has given to me, I should lose nothing. So mm-hmm. there are people who have been given to Jesus by the Father, and he's not going to lose them. Yeah. And he says this, he says, when they grumble at that, that he's not going to lose any, anybody the Father's given to him or raise him up in the last day, they are grumbling. He says, no man can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. And yeah. I will raise him up. Now, this is critical. If you want to know what Calvinism says in the, the doctrines of grace, mm-hmm. it's, it's essentially John chapter 6. Just hang out there. Hmm. No yeah. man can come to me, literally, yeah. as no man is able. He is yeah. not able to come to me unless something happens. And that's something that happens is the Father who sent me draws him. Mm-hmm. And then this is where it gets interesting because the Arminians today will say, they'll say, no, no, I believe that man is so sinful that God has to work. God has to, God has to act. Mm-hmm. Um, he's, he, he's, he's the first mover in a sense. But this is what's interesting about the text. Jesus says, no man can, he's not able to, unless the Father simply draws him. And then he says, and the Father raises him up. So yeah. everybody the Father draws, he raises up. Yeah. And so that, that's the point in terms of ability. But then, you, of course, you go into the texts that are clear about our will being enslaved. Mm. Jesus says in John eight thirty four, he says... Um, Truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who commits sin is a slave to sin. Uh-huh. Now, no matter how you come, slaves are not free. They're not free. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's, no, there's no way to say that they are. Mm-hmm. They're enslaved to sin. They are not free. And Jesus makes that promise. Mm-hmm. He says, but if the Son sets you free, you'll be free indeed. But, of course, there's, there's more. You can go into texts in Romans chapter 1. Everybody knows God. They're enemies of God. They're hostile towards God. They switch God for idols. Romans chapter 3, that, that amazing catena of verses that Paul draws from from the Old Testament to support his gospel. He says, there is none who does good. Mm-hmm. There is none righteous. And this is the powerful point. It says, there is none who seeks for God. None. Yeah. No, nobody. Nobody's looking. There is no God seeker. Uh-huh. None of us are. And I think that part of... Part of the problem here, I think, and I'm going to be, I'm going to confess to this myself, is that oftentimes mm-hmm. as Christians, we read the Bible and there are these amazing things that God says that are so profound, so deep, and so shattering right. that we don't always actually take it in and absorb it and all its implications. Uh-huh. So, for example, conflict of total depravity, when God says there is no God seeker, do we really believe that, or are we going to get mellow-headed and mm. just think that's some pithy Christian slogan mm-hmm. that, oh, yeah. what Paul, Paul is saying there is, <laughs> we're just sinners. No. He says, nobody seeks for God. Nobody. Yeah. And so <clears throat> I'll, I'll end it there, and there's more we can say, but I'll just say this, that you, you get to the point where the Scriptures teach that man is in total ruin spiritually. He is helpless. He is wicked. He is a sinner. He is not a God-seeker. He's not able to come to God. He is corrupt. He is born in sin or mm. conceived in sin. He is born dead, and Ephesians 2, I think, nails it um, on this question. It says, we were dead in our sins and trespasses, dead in our sins and trespasses, but God made us alive together with him. Amen. By grace, you've been saved. Mm-hmm. Now, yep. the point there is that we're dead spiritually, 
and it's God who makes us alive together. And then Paul summarizes with this, by grace you've been saved. Christians love to talk about being saved by grace, but what Paul means by it is that you were dead and God made you alive. Amen. Mm-hmm. That's yeah. what it means, saved by grace. Yes. Absolutely. Yes, yes. That's so good. And Jeff, this is Steve. You just answered the questions that I was just going to ask you, so <laughs> you saved me having to ask okay. them. But uh, just <laughs> one commentary that I wanted to make. Julio and I were actually talking yesterday about uh, how rebellious we are at heart. And I just thought, uh, you know, for example, the uh, the ACDC song, I guess, Highway to Hell, he, he made the comment yeah. that if that was Highway to Heaven, you know, it probably never would have been as popular as it is. But because <laughs> we are so, you know... Every part of our being is affected by that sin nature. We're just rebels at heart. We want to do the wrong, right. you know. Mm-hmm. And so, there's to say that there's there's you know inherent good in us just contradicts not only scripture but just the evidence that we see around us. Mm-hmm. That's right. Yeah, I mean it's it's all it's all around us. We we have to acknowledge it. I mean, I, I'll tell you what: if you really want to get a taste of total depravity, then then come with us to the abortion mill. Oh yeah. We do um, evangelism, and now I don't just say that because of the act of abortion and the tearing apart of another human being who's in the safety of the womb of its mother. It's a horrendous act, of course, but I mean in terms of what you will see in terms of people's genuine response to God's commands Mm, that are so obvious. They're so obvious to all of us, mothers killing their own children. Mm -hmm. It is like fundamental. This is the craziest thing. It's fundamental to who we are as human beings. It's part of our nature. Mothers care for their children. And it's something that is so obvious to all of us. These mothers will go in there and we will call out with love in a plea saying, we're trying to be a voice for your child. Mom, please don't kill your child today. We're here to help you and to love you. We'll give you anything that you need, Mm -hmm. any support that you need. And they'll turn right back around at us with this message of the love of God that will tell them about the forgiveness they can have in Christ and the gift of eternal life. They will turn around and just, just shout expletives at us. And they'll tell us, I have a right to kill my child if I want to. Um, if that's the kind of that's the kind of dark nature of the fallen heart. Is that even when you you appeal to something like say natural law, right. people will say right. like you know well, there's there's natural law. It's like but but wait a second, what do we see in the world around us? I mean, when people people appeal to natural law, it's like okay, well natural law gave to us cannibalism, people eating each other in other countries, and mm, yeah. and, and people that obviously aren't following natural law and government today in terms of the human family and abortion. It's like, so you can't just stand on that and, and it it just gets perverse and broken. People live as a law to themselves is the point I'm saying. You can't appeal to that because watch, even when you say that, yeah, God has put a law into all of our hearts. Yes, that's biblical. That's absolutely true. Even with that law in our hearts, we reject even that most Mm -hmm. basic law in our hearts. Um, And even when, even when God gives his message of love and grace into the heart of a rebel, they still remain opposed to it because they're blind. Mm-hmm. And that's, I think that if, if people, if, if there are people that say, man, oh, there's a lot of verses here, they're overwhelming, I'm, I'm still a bit confused because it, it just seems like such a, a, a change to my, my thinking, I would say, okay, if you, if you don't want to just land on the verses themselves that are explicit about our condition, then I would say, look at the life and ministry of Jesus. What were the sign miracles of Jesus pointing to? When Jesus walked up to somebody and he gave them their sight back, what did that mean? Was it, just a, was it just a Chris Angel, David Blaine sort of like wow <laughs> moment? Yeah. When Jesus like gave hearing to deaf people or when mm-hmm. he, he speaks... When he speaks into the life of a dead little girl and he says, little girl, arise, or when he says to Lazarus, Lazarus, come forth. Remember, those people died again. Like, right. that girl died, yeah. and Lazarus died again. <laughs> that stinks. <laughs> and, and so what was the point of the miracle? It was never just the miracle in itself, hmm. just to wow an audience. Yeah. yeah. The miracle yeah. signs. <clears throat> they were signs Jesus actually does. He gives sight to blind people. He gives hearing to deaf people. And he raises the dead to life, hmm. both really at the end of time, after he's won all of history, by the way, and um, that was just a plug for post by the way, sorry. <laughs> I caught that. Yeah, yeah, baby. And Jesus raises people <clears throat> from the dead now 
but but that's and this is critical. Lazarus is dead in that tomb. He's mm-hmm. dead. He's dead, yeah. dead and sinking. Yeah. And that little girl was dead in that room. She was completely dead. And yeah. Jesus is the one who called into them and raised them to life. Dead people can't do anything. Amen. They can't yeah. respond. They can't operate. Nope. They're spiritually dead. And that is a picture, an image of what exactly takes place in salvation is that he calls into us. And he speaks life into us and light. And that's, by the way, what Paul says in Corinthians. He says that the one who spoke in um, history to call light into darkness and to call everything into being, that's the God who has shown light into our life with Jesus Christ. And I think that's why, too, it's so important for us to pray for those spiritual eyes to be opened as well. You know, we can do a lot of things, but first and foremost, it's a spiritual condition that we're in. And so we need to be in, in fervent prayer for those spiritual eyes, for those, for those mothers that you're speaking of, for the people that we interact with every day, that their, that their eyes would be open spiritually. Yeah. I mean, we've seen those videos, uh, Jeff, where you're talking to those moms yeah, uh, and the res- the anger that you just get from people out there. I mean, uh, if, if, you know, and the people that are listening out there, you know, if you want to watch these, uh, YouTube videos where Jeff is out there, uh, trying to help and, um, these mothers and save these babies. I mean, I mean, it's pretty powerful of just how yeah. angry people get. Mm. Yeah, I I think Jeff one of the uh, one of the videos that really struck me the most was when you're talking to this <clears throat> this woman outside of the abor- the, the abortion mill, and uh, you you ask her what you what has more value, um, the lives of the children that are being murdered in, in the abortion mill or the rock, and she points to the rock as being more valuable. Mm. <laughs> and I think if that's yep. not a if that is not a um, eye opening moment for the total depravity of man. Then I don't know what is. Um, and yeah, and Jeff, I, want, I actually wanted to go back uh, just since we're on the topic of the, of, of, of abortion. Um, you, when you were talking with Ben Shapiro, um, he he obviously sees abortion that you shouldn't uh, cri- criminalize it. Um, but going back to the total depravity of man, I, I I don't know what episode of Apologia it was on, but you talked about how there are mothers. Who have who walk into the abortion uh, and supplant parenthood and have told you straight up, I know I'm murdering my child. Um, can yeah. you speak on that a, a little bit, like kind of just expound on that? Because I I think that is just wild. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, w- one of the things that people told me who had been doing this ministry for years when we first got into it about five years ago, going to the abortion mill to try to preach the gospel, to love these mothers and fathers, and to try to save the lives of these children. <coughs> People who have been doing this kind of sidewalk ministry, they, I said, well, we're going to offer to adopt these children. Mm. And so we, we talked to Apologia Church, and everybody at Apologia was ready to adopt. We were ready to invest money in an adoption to adopt these babies. We thought, hey, we're going to go out there and love these mothers, and we're going to say, don't worry, we'll take care of your child for you. You know, just sort of just oblivious to the whole situation. Mm-hmm. And... People told me that um, they're going to tell you that uh, they couldn't give their babies up for adoption, and then they're going to turn right around and kill their babies. Mm. Wow. And I, I, I couldn't really accept that. I mean, I didn't, I wasn't distrusting of these people who knew what they were talking about, but I, I just couldn't accept that. It was just so horrendous. Mm-hmm. And at this point, I've, I've heard that so many times that I've forgotten how many times I've been told, we'll say, well, we'll adopt your child. We'll pay for everything. You don't have to do anything. We'll pay for the medical. We'll pay for the lawyer's fees. Right. We'll pay for everything. And they'll turn around and say to us, they'll say, I couldn't give my baby up for adoption. And they'll turn around and walk inside and kill their child. Um, And the fictional victim mother that the pro-life movement has propped up for 40 years, which is devastating to the criminalization of abortion in our nation, um, it comes from the pro-life movement, Uh, Ben uh, is has definitely been influenced by the pro-life movement, so have many godly um, leaders in our nation. They've been influenced by the pro-life movement here and just adopted the party line. Yeah. They say the woman, is a, the woman is a victim. She's a victim of her environment. She doesn't know what she's doing. And I want to say the people who are saying that have not spent a lot of time outside of an abortion mill. Yeah. Because what we hear as people are going in and being supported by death scorts, the women who are supporting the women going inside and encouraging them as they go in, <laughs> trying to fight against us, What we hear is, I know it's my baby. I have a right to kill my child if I want to. Don't tell me what I can do with my child. Or they they just will tell us, I know it's my baby. Mm -hmm. I know. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to kill it. 
Wow. And so this this fictional victim mother um, is is just simply not true. We're out there on a regular basis. Our team is. I don't always get to go out uh, as, as often as I'd like to, but mm. our team and I have heard more times than we can remember from mothers that they know it's a baby and they know what they're doing and they have a right to do it. Huh. Yeah. Uh, yeah, you know, that's awesome what you guys are doing. This is Ava, uh, Jeff. Uh, you know, one of the videos, uh, just real quick uh, before um, I, I move on, um, where you guys had the bullhorn, and uh, I think one of your uh, guys got arrested earlier on because of the def- de- decibel level. And then uh, yeah. in the next video, you're coming in, hey, do you know the law? <laughs> and the one cop is getting super upset, and the supervisor comes in. I'm just sitting there like, that is awesome. And you're just quoting the 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 law to them, and they're just like super upset. But that, that was pretty awesome. Um, so just yeah, real... Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So I don't know what I don't know what happened after that. Uh, did they ever come well, back? Yeah, it was a tough situation. Yeah, it's a tough situation because the Tempe Police Department is run actually by a lesbian, mm. and she's instituted, instituted all this liberal stuff in Tempe PD, and they've had like gay pride parades for with Tempe Police Department and just just crazy mm. stuff. It's it's so ob- it's so obviously opposed to everything Christian. And so when they've come out, they've come out to harass us uh, for the last couple of years, and we've been able to stop them just by knowing the law itself, and we're able to shut them down. Well, in this case, Stephen is such a sweet guy. He was out there, and the cops came when we weren't there, and they basically confiscated his property, and they cited, criminally cited him. And we knew about that, and so we said, okay, we need to go out there, and we need to make sure that we expose this before the watching community, what they're doing to us, violating the law, because they do, they do not harass the Planned Parenthood supporters who are out there making a ton of noise, way more than us. Uh, I mean, they're, they're playing like, <laughs> you know, they're playing like uh, certain messages from Anton Sander LeVay, the leader of the Satanic Temple. They're wow. playing. I mean, they're, they're not. They're not even exercising speech. They're exercising ruckus, right. and wow. which is the code. That code of it is actually noise. They play like jackhammer sounds with uh, with a megaphone, and mm-hmm. so. We went out there, and um, I had everything ready to go. We were going to broadcast live, so when they showed up, we would be able to, you know, essentially keep them accountable. Well, obviously, we try to be gracious, but we also try to be firm, and we were able to shut the first officer down with the law itself. When the supervisor came, she was just abusive towards us. She wouldn't even look at the law. So we exposed it and praised God for these amazing tools of media that we have because within a couple of weeks, it was picked up by other major websites, and that's been seen over 5 million times now. Wow. And one guy, one guy, he's an activist, he grabbed it, and he did a whole thing on it, and it got 3 million views. And in it, he teaches everybody how to contact Tempe PD to complain about office, the officer that was doing this to us. So wow. from what I, from what I, from what I understand, um, they received thousands of phone calls and complaints and she is we the last word we got from tempe police department was that she is now on administrative leave and no longer works for tempe pd oh wow there you go that's a post mill right there (laughs) (laughs) right (laughs) so josh just to get back um... on they're they're still trying but um we're able to to try to block them with law itself so thankfully god's preserved our work out there but they definitely are trying they're definitely trying to shut us down that's awesome um yeah so so jeff how would you describe the nature of the ungenerated man in comparison with the man's new nature in christ so what i would want to do is there's a lot of places you can land in scripture for this um in terms of our identity in christ and our nature but if somebody wants to grab hold of the doctrines of grace and what they in summary and get sort of a full picture of it. I would say, go read John six, go read John 10. There's the doctrines of grace. Um, and it's clear. And I would say, take it seriously, write it down on paper, you know, draw it, draw it out as a map, do it, do whatever you have to do. But that's what we're saying is John six and John 10. But in terms of our nature, regenerate versus unregenerate, um, I would want to point people to the flow of thought in scripture from Romans chapters five through eight. And what Paul does there, it's actually spectacular. Um, you know, this is from God because it is so clear and concise. And, and I don't just don't think people can hold this together in their heads like this. Mm-hmm. But in Romans five, uh, the apostle Paul says that humanity has two representatives, 
One is Adam, one is Christ. And this does get to the doctrine of total depravity. In Adam, Paul says, all die. There's condemnation in Adam, all are dead in Adam. So if you're represented by Adam, uh, if you're still in him, then there is nothing but death and condemnation. And he says, but in Christ, all are made alive. That is, all who are in Christ are made alive, and they receive the gift of eternal life and righteousness. So he does this by way of contrasting federal heads, Adam and Jesus. If you're in Adam, there's death and condemnation. In Jesus, there's eternal life and the gift of righteousness. Then he moves the flow of thought into Romans 6, of course, where he talks about, shall we continue in sin so that grace may abound? May it never be. How shall we have died to sin continue to live in it? So he talks about our union with Christ is union with his death. And this gets to the regeneration point. If we've been made alive, according to Romans 5, in Jesus, and we've died with him, died that death with him, he says basically we've died a death to sin, like Jesus. He's never going to die to it again. It's a once-for-all thing. He says even so you consider yourselves dead to sin like that, because you are now alive. And then he moves into the question of the law itself, its purpose. And then, this is interesting, he moves into Romans 8, where he says, therefore there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, who don't walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Now he brings in what the law had promised was coming in the new covenant. And that was, as Messiah came into the world, there'd be a new covenant where God would do something new, where he'd place his law within us. Ezekiel chapter 36, Jeremiah 31, 31. The law would be internalized now, uh, and Ezekiel 36 would be given a new heart, from a heart of stone to a heart of flesh. God would put his spirit within us, and this is powerful, and by his spirit, he would cause us to observe his statutes. Mm -hmm. So in Romans chapter 8, Paul is summarizing there everything the old covenant had promised in the new by saying that those who are in the flesh, Romans 8, cannot please God. They can't even do what's pleasing to God. And of course, my, my mentor, my hero of the faith, Dr. White, he says this often, is repentance and faith pleasing to God? And of course, we'd all say, well, yeah, yes, you're yeah. a Christian. You have to say repentance and faith pleases God. Well, great, because Paul says that those who are in the flesh, that is those who are in Adam, who are dead spiritually, not in Christ, they're in the flesh. They can't even do what's pleasing to God. And he says this, he says they're not even able to obey God's law. Uh -huh. But then he contrasts that with the <clears throat> promise in a new covenant, the indwelling spirit of God, those who are in the spirit who have been raised to newness of life in Jesus, now they can actually do, fulfill the righteous requirement of the law. And when someone says, well, what's that mean? Well, Paul says it. He says, love does no harm to its neighbor. Hmm. Love is the fulfillment of the law. Those who are alive from the dead, who are regenerate and no longer dead and in the flesh, they're indwelt by the Spirit, and now they're, they're actually empowered by the Spirit of God to fulfill the law of God, which is fundamentally love God, love neighbor hmm. as you love yourself. Hmm. So the regenerate, the regenerate who's made alive loves God. The regenerate who's alive loves neighbor. The person who's in the flesh can't even do it. They're not even able to do so, and they're dead. Mm -hmm. That's the difference. According to Paul, Romans 5, Romans 8, there's a difference between the two heads, the two identities, and the difference between flesh and spirit. That's mm -hmm. regeneration. Mm -hmm. Good stuff. Good yeah, stuff, good Jeff. Good stuff. Thanks. Um, <clears throat> Jeff, uh, Ligonier, um, they did a poll on the state of theology, and they shockingly found that 67% of Americans agreed with this statement. Everyone sin at least, uh, or everyone sins at least a little, but but most people are by nature good. Um, what do you think is the case? Like, why is this so? And and what what do we do to begin to change um, unbiblical thought? Um, in America, because <clears throat> as you guys have said on your podcast and a lot of the material that we read here as well, um, I mean, just years ago, um, you know, it was the predominantly it was Calvinistic Reformed thought that founded this nation, the Puritans, and uh, now it's shifted drastically to a more Arminian view. Um, Jeff, what, what what can we do to begin to change this, especially as post millennialists? Here, <laughs> I don't want to say, I don't wanna, yeah, of course, I don't want to say anything that would be hurt. To my brothers and sisters in Christ mm -hmm. who are inconsistent or who have adopted some Arminian principles. I love them dearly. 
thank God we're not all consistent with our theology. Mm. So I know that there are brothers and sisters in Christ who hold to Arminian principles into some effect. But I, I want to say this. I believe that Arminianism has devastated the church, mm-hmm. utterly devastated it. It's devastated on yeah. so many levels because it, it isn't just a question about total depravity and limited atonement. It's a question about praxis. Mm-hmm. How do we live now? Theology matters, and theology drives our praxis. Yeah. And so when – and you're right, and this, is, this cannot be disputed. It's just a fact. Early on in American history, the colonies, you'd have been hard-pressed not to find people that were, were reformed because the Reformation theology was the founding theology of this nation. Mm-hmm. That just cannot be challenged or questioned. That's just how yeah. history went. It doesn't matter if you don't like it. That's just what happened in our history. <laughs> um, and so what happened was is Arminianism began to get in, introduced later on in the American story uh, through the Methodist Church was, was, a, was a big part of that. And the theology began to, to change and to shift. And so this, this can also be demonstrated in history. Churches that went the Arminian perspective also began to go the direction of universalism. Because if you believe that Jesus died for the sins of every single person who's ever lived, well, then the logical conclusion is there's nothing left to be punished. Which means that everybody's in heaven. Yeah. And so, you know, there's all kinds of, there's all kinds of ways that that begins to corrupt. There's also the distinctives of the Reformed faith that act as guardrails to a culture, whether in terms of our epistemology, what, how we know what we know, whether it comes to the law of God and its proper place in society, mm. uh, whether it comes to how Christians actually evangelize. And this is yeah. a big one. A, this is huge, and I'd say it's a dramatic part of a great bit of the downfall of Christian culture in the West. You see, if we think that it's up to us to manipulate people into believing in Jesus. Now, I yeah. know people will say, hey, I don't feel like I'm manipulating anybody, but the, but the truth is, and I don't mean this offensively, if we think it's, if it's up to us to convince people, mm-hmm. yeah. like if it's up to our arguments – or our ability to appeal to emotion. Mm. If we think that, then it's going to affect how we try to do outreach. Right. Yeah. You know, is the here? This is this is what I'm saying. Is the gospel? Is it a request? Right. Are, are we mm. to are we to believe are we to believe Rick Warren when he says the most awful thing imaginable at Christmas time years ago on Fox News that what he'd like for people to do is to had take a 60-day trial with Jesus. Just try him out for 60 days. <laughs> what? See, that, that's the, i, I got to say, that is the impact of the Arminian view of the gospel. Mm, yeah. Mm. yeah. See, if we think that it's, it's we just got to get people to try Jesus out, this is, an, this is a quote-unquote offer or request of the gospel, you know, would you let Jesus into your heart? Would you give Jesus a try? then the gospel message doesn't come in the way that the Apostle Paul preached it or the apostles preached it, preached it in the first century where it turned the entire empire on its head. Right. It's changing culture. The church has turned the world upside down. Because you see, the difference between the Arminian gospel and the Reformed gospel is the Reformed gospel comes by way of command. Hmm. Yeah. Repent and believe the gospel. God commands you to repent of your sins and to turn to Christ. That's a command. And the Arminian perspective, and this can be demonstrated, I, I will not be hard to do so. If somebody wanted to make a point of debate about this, it is not hard to demonstrate that the Arminian theology led to kinds of outreaches and crusades that were built largely upon appeals to emotion, mm-hmm. manipulation, and trying very, very hard to work to convince the mind of the person to try Jesus or to accept him in some way, yes. that is very different. It is so different from Jonathan Edwards and the sinners in the hands of an angry God. Mm-hmm. Why is it that we can look in history at, say, the first and second great awakening, and we can see that those are Calvinistic, um, those are Calvinistic moves in history where literally – when, when these things came through and the gospel was proclaimed from a reform perspective, entire cities, towns were changed. Hmm. Like when these people would come to Jesus, the next day the brothels are closed, hmm. huh. right? Like, like <laughs> stuff is shutting down. It's, it's changing. But yeah. the amazing thing is, is some, of, some of these Arminian uh, evangelistic moves come through, and you'll have people say things like, um, yeah, you know, 15,000 people came up to receive Christ. And then for the next six months, that city looks the same. Right. Yeah. 
Yeah. And this comes down to regeneration and the proclamation of the gospel, which is the power of God to save. Now, mind you, I want to say this very clearly because I know I have brothers I love and respect that disagree with me on this point, and I have to right. say this out of respect to them. I am not saying in any way that people don't get saved at these Arminian kind of based um, evangelistic right. outreaches. Mm-hmm. I'm not saying that. Because, as Van, Van Til said, God can strike straight blows with crooked sticks. Hmm. Amen. You know? <laughs> Amen. However, as I say often, I don't believe that we should be looking around for crooked sticks to hit people with. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, I think that we need to be using the right methods. And what, and this is maybe one of the final things we'll say here, unless you guys have more to ask, what you believe on this point. This is not just an instance of theological gymnastics. This isn't just something that doesn't matter. It did matter to Jesus. It mattered to Paul enough to write entire chapters on the subject. It mattered to Isaiah in Isaiah chapters 40 through 46. It matters in Daniel chapters 2 and 4. It matters in Scripture a lot. Mm. But what you believe here is going to dramatically impact your mission in the world and how you do it, how you live in the world. Yeah. It will impact you. I guarantee this. Mm. I've been in a hospital and at hospital beds more time than I can remember. I've, been, I've done funerals. So many funerals, funerals for, for dead babies. I've done funerals for dead friends, funerals for, um, for people that died unexpectedly and devastated families. And I, I got to tell you that what you believe on these points will impact you at the deathbed. Hmm. It's going to impact oh, you yeah. at the cancer bed. It's yeah. going to impact you when you go out and hit the streets and preach the gospel. Yeah. It Amen. does impact how you gospel. So this stuff matters a lot. Yes. Amen. Amen. We would completely agree with what you said, Jeff. Uh, all right. Last, uh, last uh, question. Uh, well, can you share the gospel with our listeners? Of course. So the good news in Scripture, gospel means good news, and the good news in Scripture is called the gospel of God. It's God's good news. It's the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's the good news of Jesus Christ. It's also the gospel of the kingdom, the good news of the kingdom of God, the rule of God in the world. God had promised in the Old Testament, in history, that he was going to undo what was brought into the world through our rebellion and sin, through the work of the devil. God, in the very beginning of the story, in Genesis chapter 3, promises that he's going to crush the head of the serpent. He's going to deliver us from the enemy. He's going to deliver a mortal death blow to the work of the enemy in the world. And hmm. he, he promises this beautiful story of redemption from the start. He promises that he's going to send a Messiah who would take upon himself our sins. He would redeem us. He would be pierced through for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities. He would, um, he would justify the many as he'd bear their iniquities. That's in Isaiah 53. He was going to um, bring all the families of the earth back to God in salvation. Every tribe, tongue, people, and nation yep. would return to worship the Lord. We learn in the Old Testament and New Testament that we are fallen, rebels against God, violators of his law. We are condemned without God. We only have to answer for his justice because all we have is sin before his throne. We are not righteous. We are not good. We don't seek for God. It says that even our righteousnesses are as filthy rags to God because God is so holy and we are so sinful. Mm. And we are guilty of violating all of God's law. And the good news of the gospel is that Messiah, that King, God's appointed Redeemer, has entered into the world, God himself in the person of Christ, took on flesh, entered into the world to represent his people, to live the life that they have not, to live a life of perfect obedience to the law of God, the law that we have broken, he perfectly obeyed. Hmm. And in this Messiah, even though he was righteous and innocent and blameless in representing us, he died a death on the cross that we deserve. We deserve to die for our sins. He took our death, and in taking our death, he received in his own body the wrath of God for the sins of his people. He exhausted that wrath. Hmm. He died, was buried, and he conquered death, rose again from the dead, and God raising Christ from the dead was testimony to the fact that this is God's Messiah, this is his Redeemer. He is the one to bring salvation to the ends of the earth. He rose again from the dead. He's ascended and seated. He is the ruler of the world, the king of the world. And the call of the gospel, the good news is 
come to Christ and live. Amen. Repent Amen. of your sins, turn away from all your sins and all your righteousnesses, come to God, put your faith in Christ and what he's accomplished and him alone, be redeemed and rescued. The Bible says, favorite verse I have is John five twenty four. Jesus says, truly, truly, I say to you, he who hears my voice and believes him who sent me has eternal life and does not come into judgment, but is passed out of life or out of death into life. Amen. And so the call of the gospel is to repent and believe the good news. Come mm-hmm. to Christ, Savior, the Lord, the King of the world, be reconciled to God and live. Amen. Yes. Wow. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Jeff, for coming on to the program again. We would love to have you back whenever you can. Yeah. Um, thank you so much. Pleasure. Appreciate it. All right, ladies and gentlemen, this wraps up today's episode of Bridge Radio. Uh, be sure to like, share, share with your mom, your dad, your cats, your dogs, your brothers, your sisters, and all that. Uh, next week, we have John Sampson coming on the program again to talk about unconditional election. Uh, the following week, we have uh, Dr. James White coming on talking about limited atonement. Irresistible grace is going to be discussed by uh, Tim Trumpert. And Joel Beakey is going to be talking about perseverance of the saints to end it all off. So a lot of good stuff here on Bridge Radio, guys. Please stay tuned. Again, uh, love your neighbor as you love yourself. And uh, love the Lord God with all your heart, mind, and soul. And we'll see you on the next one. Thank you. See you. Bye.